again, thank you very much for joining us uh, on our third episode of our portfolio webinar to nail that UX job. Arturo and Betty here. We're going to be your hosts for today. And why don't we start by introducing ourselves? My name is Arturo Rios. I am a UX designer and coffee lover at Wiseline. I've been working here for one year and a half, and I'm focused on the consulting side of the company. So I get to work with organizations in different industry verticals, such as media and e-commerce. And I also facilitate a lot of workshops for internal and external teams. And I'm also part of the hiring committee. So I get the opportunity to interview candidates, review their challenges. And I also am part of the academy committee. So I get to uh, work in these kinds of sessions and public speaking. And these are my social networks. And you can check my public work on arturoreal.me after finishing the webinar. And I'm Bere. I'm a senior technical writer in Wiseline. And similarly to Arturo's, I've been working with a lot of companies from different industries. And pretty much my job is to communicate clear messages through documentation. That could be documentation about the products that we're building, mostly very technical products but they all help our customers with different goals like adoption of the product or to continue the support of one of the products. So we write daily on daily basis for engineers or for regular people. I pretty much um, live just from writing. Awesome. So before this session, we have two sessions. On the first one, we had Christina and Chisa, who talked about the importance of having a personal brand, a strong brand that represents you, and getting to know your areas of opportunity, your skills, your design values. And then uh, during the past week, we had Javier Maran and Daniela Contreras, who talked about how to better select the projects that we have to showcase those personal brands. And now we have our agenda for, this was the recap the recap that yeah. Javier and Daniela shared. They talk about the audience, also listing projects, and also Javier shared an amazing tool called Notion to like track all your projects with all the metadata and skills and how to navigate the NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, which are really hard, and how to ch choose the best ones. So what is next, better? Well, the name of our session, writing case studies. Exactly. The next step is to actually write the case studies. How can we elaborate on these uh, projects that we worked on to better showcase our design skills or soft skills or technical skills that help other people to understand the value that we can provide. And we're going to be doing that through a series of agenda. First, we're going to elaborate on what are actually case studies then how can we uh, focus them to your audience? We're gonna be talking about storytelling and also Beth is going to share some really cool uh, insights about navigating the writing process. Yeah, that's it, very good. And also a friendly reminder, we have the Wiseline Academy Slack channel for all of you to ask us some questions. So please ask the question. And we also have the Zoom chat, I believe, to ask your questions. Yeah, I think we can write questions at any point in time during the session and we will be making some pauses whenever there's a new question so that we can get back to you sooner. Okay so let's talk about case studies. Uh, the better definition of case studies is that they are in-depth explorations and descriptive processes of any endeavor or project you worked on and the key points of a good case study is that they are very contextual. They give all the details about the environment in which the project happened. Uh, a great example is that one of the design research tools that we do, do is contextual inquiries. When you go to the, the homes of a person or their works and then you get a lot of pictures and then you take a lot of notes and you document the whole uh, endeavor. And that gives other people uh, better tools to understand what happened there. So what makes a bad case study when you're just showing the high visuals of the project and you're not focusing about how did you make decisions. And the first thing that we need to consider about case stories and projects is that you should approach your portfolio as a UX project. Okay. So Tim Brown, uh, the CEO of IDEO, a very renowned design agency, was interviewed by Debbie Millman on a podcast called Design Matters that I highly recommend. And she asked Tim, 
Hey team, you are one of the most influential business leaders and design leaders. What was your training? How did you get there? And he said, I didn't have any training, but what I did was to embrace every business problem as a design problem with the, best, with the same uh, user-centered approach. And I think that's something that we can extrapolate and apply to our project. So when we're working on our portfolio, we need to consider uh, the research done before, some deadlines, uh, who is going to be the audience, for example. That's very important. Critical, critical. And that's another key uh, aspect. You are not the user of your portfolio. And that's something I'm going to repeat. You are not the user of your portfolio. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've seen a lot of designers that use their portfolio as a canvas in which they want to express themselves and show their tools and skills and micro interactions. And they forget that the case story and the portfolio should tell the story about the content and about the project that you work on. Yeah, definitely. You could be an artist, but this is not the canvas that you should be working on. Exactly. So the first step is to getting to know your audience. And you can have a lot of audience. For example, design uh, designers that are uh, taking a look at your projects because may, you might be working with them. Also hiring managers, uh, recruiters, or even CEOs of small companies that are interested in getting to know more about you. So you have to ask yourself, what are they looking for? What are they interested in getting to know them, to know about them and what turns them, them off? In early stages, uh, normally recruiters are asking themselves three questions about you. The first one is, can this person do the job? Okay, does this person have the skills enough to do the job? The second question is, will this person do the job? And that's about soft skills and that's about motivation, right? This is really hard to just uh, showcase on a portfolio. But that's important. The importance of having a personal brand. So you tell the same story on your portfolio and on a, on, a, on a phone interview, on an email. And the third question is, how is this person going to impact the team? Okay, so that's about cultural fit. So Seth Godin, who is a marketing guru, he is like the Donald Norman, but for marketing. <laughs> and he has written uh, 18 bestseller books. Wow. So he knows, uh, I think, about uh, marketing. And he says that there are two ways that you can uh, get a job, nail a job. The first one is by feeling more than anyone else. And the other one is standing out more than anyone else. Now, the problem with feeling more is that it's not scalable. Once the job description changes, you're not a fit anymore. And no one wants to be the person that, oh, it's because we reveal a lot of candidates and you were the better. You are the, the one default. Who fits the most. But when you're standing out more than anyone else, there's no mm -hmm. ceiling because you are the better version, your own version of designer. And that's what we should be striving for. So this is not something that you can just wish and it's gonna happen overnight. You need to take into consideration how to stand out. And we're gonna present you with a formula. And that is, Satisfaction equals X perception minus expectation. Okay, so what is perception? Perception is all the information that your audience receives about you. Your portfolio, the phone interview, how do you write emails, uh, how do you tweet, for example, all that information is the perception that they form. But they might have some specific questions they, they want to ask themselves, and those are the expectations. And once you're able to meet those expectations, you can work on the higher level, which is satisfaction. And I've seen a lot of designers who focus a lot on the satisfaction level. They want to craft the best layout. They want to focus a lot in micro interactions and they forget about this foundational, which is the expectation. So we can deconstruct expectations in four uh, key buckets, problems, process, outcomes, and deliverables. These are the four uh, aspects that you should be taking into consideration when you're crafting your case studies. So why don't we start with problems? Every great design project starts with a great challenge, right? A great pro a problem. And this might be a problem for a user. Maybe they have a painful experience in their journey. It might be a problem for the business. They're not having enough conversion and they're not meeting their, their uh, yearly targets. So the importance here is to tell a great challenge. If the problem that you are uh, saying is that, oh, I was given a set of requirements that my manager gave me. That's not a really interesting challenge, That's right? That's boring. 
yeah, and it's just a problem for you to design if you don't deliver. It's not a problem for any group of people. So we have an example here of Joel Khalifa, a great designer who's currently working at uh, GitHub. And what he did was to show how he decided to redesign the onboarding experience of one of the companies he was working on. And what he did was to show all the journey, which was a really cumbersome journey. And for example, you have to sign up, then you would need to land on a screen with a lot of steps, and then you have to go to your email, confirm your email, go back to the, uh, to the landing page. You can do anything else but uh, registering. So that was a really cumbersome uh, problem. And then he also mentioned some KPIs and some numbers that were not being met. So the key takeaways of this is that you can describe visually how challenging, how difficult is the problem, and also some hard facts that we can remember afterwards. The next step to consider is the process. Now, truth be told, there is no one recipe that you can use to solve all your uh, design problems. Every problem is unique in its way. So if you're telling me, oh, I use a user-centered design and design thinking, that might not be enough. Maybe it's an, even a no-brainer, right? So you need to really describe not only the process that you follow, but also what are the design decisions that you make, because it's really hard that you uh, nail the, pro the project with the process that you were taking into consideration without any deviations whatsoever. So we are interested in getting to know what kind of decisions did you make, uh, what kind of framework did you leverage? It was a new product or an existing product? If, it's, if it was an existing product, did you decide to do usability testing or heuristic evaluations to start uh, working on the project? You have to remember that the devil is in the details. We always want to know the details and you have to bring us that. Exactly, that's a great point. And we have an example of Muriel and I really like this uh, case study because she is very uh, thorough and detailed about what she worked on. And she started with a, a version of the design thinking process. And she also mentions the tools that she used. What I don't like about this case study is that everything is very linear and there's mm -hmm. not like deviations of the plan. And that helped us a lot for the hiring managers and reviewers to get into know how do you make decisions? What do you prioritize the most? Mm -hmm. So that's something that you should take into consideration. The next one is outcomes. And by outcomes, we mean the result of the project. And this can be uh, divided into three steps. It was a positive outcome for the business. Maybe they achieved the KPI they were looking for. Maybe they increased their revenue, or maybe it was a better experience for the user. For example, a project that I worked on, uh, we had to redesign the experience of assigning spots for people that were doing tailgating, which is a very common tradition in the United States. And the users of the platform were uh, spending 60 hours a week mm. to allocate uh, like 300 people. So that was really, really painful for them. And we managed to reduce that number in, I think, 17 hours. So that's a great wow. outcome. Definitely a great outcome. Yeah. But not all the outcomes have to be about business of the users, especially in early stages. Maybe you didn't achieve the outcome you were expecting to achieve, but maybe you learned a lot. And that's also important for us to, to review. What were the biggest takeaways and learnings that you gathered through the project, right? So it's not about just failing because of failing, but reflecting back and what did you get out of those uh, learnings. And this is a great example by Jenny who works at Bueno. She worked on a campaign for Adidas and they were redesigning 14 boots for an special edition of the uh, Predator boot. And what they did was to work on a, on a highly talented team of 3D modelers and art directors. And they created these characters based on animals and dangerous animals. And they, they translated that into special boots. Mm. And she worked on all the campaign. And she is very thought of as of what were the outcomes that they gathered. For example, it was one of the most visited online product experience of Adidas oh. ever. So that's a great example of an outcome. And also the product interaction was great because it was four times longer than average. Wow. And finally, we have the output. And back in the day, this was called deliverables, right? Deliverables. But now they're called artifacts. At the end of the day, it's just information that we create or models that we create to share or design decisions. And that's important for us 
because it helps us to understand and realize what are your organizational skills, how do you make decisions about how to spend your time crafting uh, these artifacts. But the most important thing is what did you do with those artifacts? Because we, as the reviewers, we don't have like a checklist of all the things that you need to do, like heuristic evaluation, check, right? That's not how we do it. We really want to understand why did you decide to build that specific artifact? What did you learn uh, with it? And how do you share it? And for example, we have the case study of Emily Carlin, who actually put into Slack, hey, I work on this board, on this user flow, please give me feedback. And then she also worked on a design system, which is a, which is a great uh, artifact to build. So in order to meet the expectations of your audiences, you need to focus on problems, process, outcomes, and deliverables or output, okay? Yeah, your case study must have all the information of each of these areas. Do you have any questions so far? Seems like we're good. Please feel free to ask us some questions and we're going to uh, answer them promptly. Oh, looks like Diego is typing something, but don't worry, Diego. We will get to your question as soon as... Perfect, thank you, Diego. So now, you already met those expectations and then you can work on the next level, which is going to help you to stand out from the competition. And then is where you can show your leadership skills, how do you communicate, how do you collaborate, how do you organize yourself, how do you negotiate with stakeholders. Which this one is actually very related to Sergey's question. How about your role? Most of the time you don't work alone, meaning probably should you include the particular role that you included? Yeah, that's also a great question. And it's very important for you as a designer to uh, specify within your process what were the what was the role that you uh, had and who else worked on the project and who was uh, owner of what. For example, during a project that I worked on, I was responsible for all the interaction design part, but there was someone who was working on the visual and UI design part. And we also had some QA and then copy. And that's something that I uh, always try to, to put specifically in our case studies. Great, and we have uh, another question from Diego. What kind of media do you recommend to show your process? It could be a short video well, or more like a storyboard. I think it's highly contextual of the story you want to tell. If you think that a, a storyboard might be a better tool for you to tell the story, uh, that's great if you want to do it through a video. The problem with the video, in my uh, personal uh, point of view, is that you, it's really hard to try to find what word you're looking for because you don't have like the text. So you need to be go back and forth on the video. So that might not be really uh, a great idea. And it's also more difficult and it takes more effort to do. And we're going to be in a little bit more into the, we're going to go a little bit more into the topic about what would be better for your story and also the way you bring this case study to life on the next session that we're going to have next week. Exactly. So now let's talk about storytelling. Probably you already know this, but your audience is not going to read your portfolio word by word. They hate reading. People hate reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. And maybe because they are very busy, they need to review a lot of applications, a lot of challenges, a lot of portfolios. So you have this really challenge, which is that you want to showcase your process, your problem, your outcomes, but they're not willing to read. So how, what can we do? Well, if you're able to craft your case study in a meaningful way, in a storytelling way, that can help you a lot to really uh, deliver the message that you want to deliver. And that's the importance of storytelling. Good. There's a good question from Hector that I believe it will be very, very valuable towards the end of the session so that you got the big idea but just bringing it back now is like, what do you recommend for newbies recently graduate from Ironhack? Good skills, but no experience. Well, I think there's a lot of ways that you can tackle that. If you have a really great uh, project that you want to work on, it doesn't matter if it's not for a client or for a real company, you can work that as a case study. And that's something that is really important for us and meaningful for us because you get to put into practice your skills as a designer. Probably, let's say, like, not because you didn't get paid for the job, it doesn't mean that it didn't give you any experience. You might bring that. Yes, and if you have a project that you consider it's important, you learn a lot while in college, you can take that as your first uh, project. Okay. I think that's important for us also to, to realize. 
Great, thank you for the question. Now going back to stories. Okay, so we have a lot of tools to craft meaningful stories. One of the most famous ones is what it's called the Freytag's Pyramid. It was developed by Gustav Freytag uh, in, I think, the 19th century. And it's really popular and it's really simple to use. And it describes all these steps that the hero goes through. For example, the first one is the exposition. And the exposition is where you uh, describe the context, you describe the stage, you uh, talk about the hero and their goals. And then you have an inciting event, something that triggers the rest of the story, right? And after this inciting event, you have a series of actions, which is the rising action. And what we're trying to do here is to create tension because you don't want your story to fall flat or to become like meaningless and boring. You really need to create that drama and create anticipation until you reach to the crisis moment. In video games, this is very famous when you're realizing <laughs> that you need to fight that boss and you're at the door of the boss and you're about to fighting them. And then you have the climax, which is the most important part of the story in terms of emotion. This is where you fight a boss and this is where the, the battle is taking place. And then you have the falling action or what is called the denouement, which is a French word, which means unknotting or untangling the rest of the story. This is where all the loose ends come into place. And then you have the happily ever after ending. Yay. So why don't we review this uh, with a real or a simulated project? For example, uh, you have the current state and this is a company is called BuzzFeed. And BuzzFeed <laughs> is a web portal with interactive content for younger audiences, right? And they've been in the market for five years. But now they realize that they're starting losing some daily active users. And they believe it was, it's because Facebook is stealing them, right? So that's the insight in the problem, the, the call to action. So that's where you came into place. They talk about, they, they call you and then you start your process. You uh, do all your user design center process. And then you realize there are some impediments. Maybe the scope changed, maybe your team changed maybe you realize that working on an advertising model is really hard because you need to fight with ads and that's not a really interesting experience so those are the impediments and that those try to create tension and conflict in the story which is very important and then you solve the problem you realize that during spring free one of the most uh, important usability testing was that uh, a root problem was that some people was causing uh, slow performance and they were making the users to go up and that was breaking the UI. You solve that problem and then you have your goals met of the users. They're returning to the, to the site and your business is meeting their expectations and their goals, right? So this is an example, how can you apply the freight tax pyramid to your case study? To be, make it be an interesting story. Yes, and we have a lot of other models, for example, the hero's journey which is very used in a lot of uh, interesting stories and, and movies. Uh, and you have like the, the hero of the journey and then they also have the call to adventure. They meet a mentor, for example, in Star Wars, when Luke meets uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi and they <laughs> have a lot of challenges and dungeons and you fight the, the boss and then you return to your ordinary world as a different person, as a transformed person. But not then need to be diagrams. You can also have a checklist, for example, the pixel rules, which uh, say that we always admire more a character for trying than for the success itself. And also coming up with the ending before you figure out the middle, uh, just saying Game of Thrones. <laughs> and also you need to consider why you should tell the story. In other words, makes, make me care. I am the reader and I should be uh, considered as well. Mm -hmm. So if you're interesting, interested in getting to know more about storytelling, I just published a Medium article that elaborates on all these uh, artifacts and techniques that you can use. So now we're going to do some prep work about your case studies. And the first thing that we need to understand is defining the big picture. If you're familiar with the design sprint process, one of the first steps that we do is the long-term vision, like a start at the end. And that's exactly what we're gonna do when you're crafting your case study, you're gonna start at the end. So let's say that you crafted a really great case study. Everyone is very engaged when they're reading it. So what did you do right? And you're gonna ask yourself these questions. For example, what would your audience remember your case study for? 
what are the skills, the tools, the challenges that you uh, uh, used and are the most have to speak about, and also what makes it special and unique, what makes it memorable, okay? So these are just triggered questions. The next step is to do one of the most important exercise and common exercise in, in design, which is ideation through brain dumping. So what I normally do is to grab a whiteboard, grab uh, sticky notes and also Sharpies, and then start brain dumping all the ideas, all those things that I really want to showcase on my portfolio, right? But there's a lot of ideas that you can come up with. Mm -hmm. and that's great, but we need to prioritize them. So the next step is to prioritize your insights to realize what are the most important aspects to tell about your story. And we recommend this method, which is called Moscow. And what it does is that you divide your insights into must have, what is really important to, to show, should have some things that might not be as important, but you can also talk about could have the least important things and also won't have, right? You need to make some decisions here. For example, one of the most have that I talked on in one of my case studies is that I learned a lot about A-B testing and experimentation. So that was one of the most have that I uh, thought and I, I put it into the most have part. Do you have anything in your one half? Well, yeah, I also was overseeing the part of the design system, but I was not the owner of the design system. So I thought it was not as relevant to talk about the design system because I was not the owner of that part. Mm -hmm. And then you define your outline, right? And you can do it this in two ways. I am a very visual person. So what I do is to uh, do a lot of lo-fi sketches to craft this outline. And this is where you can also explore some layouts and understand where you can put some images to better tell the story, where you're gonna have some chunks of text to elaborate on the story. But you can also do that with an outline. Which is what I prefer as a writer. I love the bullet list with, with levels of what should come first, then next, and the different levels. <laughs> okay. And yeah, that you can do it either way. What is really important to understand that you should not start with a blank canvas because that's really hard. So if you start with an outline, that's going to be more easy to elaborate uh, afterwards on the description of the process. And that's it. We're going to listen to Bere <laughs> talking about the writing process. So Bere. And we're going to do a quick change of... Now I'm going to own the questions. And I'm going to own the presentation. So please bear with me. All right. So the writing process for case studies, how does it look like? Well, believe it or not, it does already look a lot like your design process. First, you have the research where you do a lot of gathering of information about your cases and your audiences, which you already did over to this point. Then you organize your ideas, precisely what Arthur was talking about, creating an outline with all the information that you have. And now it comes writing the actual first draft of your case study. And later we will have a review, whether it's a self-review of your text or a peer review of your text. And finally, the last step of the writing process is publishing, bringing your content to the world. But this step of the writing process will be covered next week. So for now, we're just going to focus on draft and review. So remember, if you have any questions, you can bring it up whenever you want and we'll get to it. We have a question uh, for, uh, from Gustavo. Thank you, Gustavo. And he says, uh, what do you recommend for veterans that have some empiric experience and also projects, but no official education and learning? In my uh, point of view, I think that experience always is going to trump education. If you're able to showcase your skills, the potential value that you can add to an organization, and you have an education that it's a, a strong background, uh, it may be not as important as the real experience and the value and the skills that you're showcasing. Because that means that you acquired those skills through real experience and real challenges. So that's more important. Great, thank you. Now, writing process. So the first one we're gonna cover is regarding drafting, but just like with the designing process, you have to know your audience. And in this case, 
What does your audience see when they read? Well, they read in an F-shaped pattern and you have to get a little bit familiar with this. What does it mean? Well, it's very simple. The readers first read the upper part, meaning the headings. They read the first paragraph and they're like, oh, okay, cool. This is the main idea of the whole situation. Audio, okay, cool. And the next is that they start checking the first part of the following sentences or the following paragraphs. Like they make quick checks on the, on the second, third, fourth paragraph maybe. And they end up with a vertical scan towards the bottom. They never finish reading an article fully. So it becomes an F shape pattern, all right? And within this shape, F shape pattern, what they see is the headings. So. Always keep into consideration that your headings, your titles, they must convey the essence of the topic. They must be also short, and if possible, they must use the same type of words among them. So what am I saying? Look at this option of titles. Pretend that each one of them is a title. First one says, why I didn't pursue engineering, the road to becoming a new exer. Your following title says, my first solo project. And then the following title says, Audit Project Story. They don't look alike. I mean, they are valid titles, but- But just enough valid, right? Yeah, they're good, let's say. What would you think about these titles? From engineering to UX, from solo contributor to team player, from local to global success. What do you think about those, Arturo? I think I like them better because we are using one of our secret uh, tools, which is contrast. You're creating contrast and conflict between them. And that makes it more interesting to me. Definitely. So you really have to put a lot of thinking into your headings. They are not just there because use headings as a good, as a tool for you. So the other thing that your audience sees through your F patterns are lead lines. These are also known as topic sentences, and they are the very first line of every single paragraph. And because they lead the paragraph, everything within the paragraph is tied back to it. And also, because everything goes back to it, they must be clear and they should be short. All right, so let's look at a quick example over here. I have a paragraph that says, some of your most personal moments are shared on WhatsApp, which is why we build end-to-end -end encryption into the latest version of our app. When end-to-end -end encrypted, your messages, photos, video, voice messages, documents, and calls are secure from failing into the wrong hands. This means that you, only you and the person you're communicating can read and listen to them, and nobody in between, not even WhatsApp. If you were the regular audience and you only read the first line, which is the lead line, you will still know the main idea behind the paragraph. You will still know that WhatsApp encrypts your messages and that's why they are safe and that's the whole point of a lead line if they are going to be the only things that your readers read make it important all right and now images which is a little bit related to the question about using videos probably well a picture is worth a thousand words that's totally true but you still need some words at the end all right you still need to be able to communicate through text, whatever you wanna say. Because if you fill your case studies only with images, well, maybe one person will understand something from your image, and maybe one person will understand the other thing, like completely different. And the only way to make sure that you are conveying the message that you wanna convey is through text, all right? So just a recap, your audience sees an F pattern, they see headings, they see lead lines, and they see images. So focus on those ones, all right? Now that you are thinking on, well, I have to focus on that ones, and I need to write some words, well, how do you write for them? Like actual text put in into... That's a good question to answer. And you will do that through the use of four Cs and the use of parallelism, and we are going to cover each of them carefully now. So the first one is clarity. Okay. Okay, you have to be clear. That's the whole point of it. Now let's pretend that you have this text. Seen on a Korean knife, kitchen knife. Warning, keep out of children. So would that mean that I can put the kitchen knife into an adult, but not a children? Hmm. 
it could be that, right? Or maybe I, I could just, I don't know, pass it around to somebody else, just not children. Like I can kill people with that knife, but just not children. <laughs> That's the point, right? That's what it breeds. It's not pure enough. It's not pure enough. And I have another example here. I want money as quickly as I can get it. I have been in bed with the same doctor for two weeks and he doesn't do me any good. If things don't improve, I will stand for another doctor to help him. So, so two doctors? He will have two doctors in bed with this person. There will be three people in a bed. Um, maybe won't be so enjoyable. I'm not too sure of it. But that's the thing. I'm not sure. It's not clear. It's ambiguous, right? It's totally ambiguous. And the last one. For sale, piano by a woman with carved mahogany legs. Now talk about ambiguity. I believe that the woman is the one with the mahogany legs. Or maybe the piano, we don't know, because it is not clear. So you have to be very, very clear to avoid this confusion whenever they are reading your text. Now we can move on to coherence. Now I have two text here, so option A and option B. Option A says Sarah likes jump, running, and skate. And option B says Sarah likes jumping, running, and skating. Which one reads better? I like option B better because it has more rhythm. It has more rhythm. It flows. When you read it out loud, especially out loud, it, it just helps you read it more fluently, let's say. That's the importance of coherence. This is what we know as coherence between words. When you use similar words so that the reader sort of expects what the upcoming word is going to be about, all right? And here's another example of coherence. Now, I have exactly the same paragraph in both options, except the ones that are highlighted. They have the correspondence. Now, if I were to read these ones, and bear with me, I will read them, you have to tell me which one flows better. The first one says, the most important part of an essay is the thesis statement. The thesis statement introduces the argument of the essay. The thesis statement also helps to create a structure to the essay. Now, the option B says, the most important part of an essay is the thesis statement. This statement introduces the argument of essay. It also helps to create a structure for the essay. So, which one feels better? I like option B better because you're not repeating this statement again and again and again. Yeah, and this connection is what we call coherence between sentences. This helps um, emphasize the fact that one sentence is communicated with the next one and helps the text flow. It flows better. Do you have any questions around there? We have a question from Carlos and he's asking what language is better when writing case studies and building a portfolio? English, native, what do you think better? Well, depends on your audience. <laughs> that was exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, totally. I mean, if you want to get a job for on a company that's still, that is based on the U.S. and only based on the U.S. and they only speak English, well, you better write it in English. But if you're applying for jobs here in Mexico for companies that even their customers are speaking in Spanish, well, it's perfectly okay to write in Spanish. I agree. Thank you. No problem. All right. We, is there another question or we're good? Uh, we have from Eduardo Palencia, who's more related to the whole uh, webinar. As industrial designer, what would happen if I put some of my product design experience using all these tools that we are learning with my other digital projects? I think that's great. I have an industrial design uh, background, actually, and I realized that my experience with prototyping physical uh, objects was also related to my experience working with physical, with digital prototypes. So if you're able to articulate your skills, your core skills, and your knowledge in semiotics and ergonomics and gestalt theory, it doesn't matter if you're applying it to physical or digital products, as long as you're being able to articulate them in a great way. That's something great. I just learned something new from you. <laughs> you're welcome, Betty. <laughs> we can continue then. Okay, cool. So coherence between sentences, all right? Just make one sentence relate to the other one. And we can go back to conciseness. Simple two options. The first one says, today people think it's more important to express ideas concisely. And option B says, in this day and age, people are under the impression that it is important to express ideas in a concise manner. 
both of them say exactly the same things, but one of them is shorter. So the point is avoid using unnecessary words that don't add any value. If you can say the same thing in a shorter sentence, go for the shorter sentence. I mean, yes, you can be poetic about the topic and try to express all the things that you want to express. But remember, this is not the canvas where you express yourself. This is the work where you present yourself to others. Your audience don't, does not like to read a lot, so make it short, make it concise. Yeah, and, and I believe that is something that we also shared with design because we have this uh, theater uh, realms principle, which is as little design as possible, right? It's about simplifying, you which think. is really difficult. Mm -hmm. It's not just removing words, but really very be very thought of about how, what do you remove and what do you leave. I believe that there is a, 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 an anecdote from one American writer that says he was writing a letter and, and the introduction letter to the letter was like, I do not have much time to write a short letter. So here is a long letter for you. That's exactly right. Writing short things definitely takes a lot of time. To, but anyway. But it's worth it. It's worth it. Definitely worth it, people. All right. So moving on to consistency. All right. Um, consistency can be represented on your text through many things. One of the things could be capitalization. You could say user experience designer, like user being the only word capitalized, or you can say user experience designers with every word capitalized, all right? You have to decide which one of them you're gonna use and you have to stick to it. You can say the password field or the password field without any capitalization. So you have to just decide which one of them you're gonna be using. And you can also have consistency through your naming convention. Are you gonna be saying, user story map, or are you gonna say user story mapping? Which one are you gonna pick? Pick one and stick with it. Also, UX designer or user experience designer. Which one is the name you're gonna be using? Just stick to that one. And that's a saying for us writers, if you make a mistake, at least you're making it consistently, okay? So you just stick to consistency. When you said something, just stick to it, all right? Another thing that we have in relation a lot because as designers, we don't want for users to have a lot of learning and uh, allocating cognitive effort into learning all these new terms. So if as much consistency as possible, it's what we should be striving for. And we have some questions. The first one from Sergey. Thank you for asking, Sergey. Uh, how about using Grammarly or some other tools to improve the content? Definitely, I personally use Grammarly. Grammarly is a great tool to verify your text. And I actually, Grammarly has a special setting for technical writing, like for technical documents with very um, technical items. It helps you a lot to double check. But the point is you cannot add emptiness to Grammarly. You have to think things through right. and write your sentences. And then when you say like, oh, okay, I believe that this is good enough. You paste it to Grammarly and then Grammarly will give you some feedback. These tips that we're going over right now is whenever you are on the first process of coming up with the text. And after you write your first draft, you can go to Grammarly and pretty much review it. And definitely it's a great tool. There's also another one called Hemingway app. That is HemingwayApp.com. It is very, very good one. And that one is free. Grammarly is not free. <laughs> okay. So it can be part of the process. Yes, definitely is part of your process, which is actually the next step on the process that we're going to cover in a few minutes. Yeah, but before we move on, we have a question from Victor. Thank you, Victor. Uh, he says that we don't read with scan. That's totally true. Really true. Uh, how will you showcase your research skills, user persona, user journey map, usability test? And uh, he's also an industrial designer. So you can do it in, in a lot of ways. You can show some of the artifacts in a visual way. So you create like this hook in the, in the case study, and you can say, how do you do them? For example, you run some interviews and then you distill them through affinity diagrams on some behavioral variables. So I think what it's more important is to understand and realize how that information relates to the whole story. Definitely, that's what I was gonna say. How would you fit that into your story? Because the point is not just showing all the artifacts that you did through the whole thing, but which ones fit on the story to tell what you want to tell. 
yeah that's a key thing which ones add value Definitely. to the narrative that you are creating and they're not like stopping the the reader or their current uh confusion yeah like imagine let's pretend that you are talking about one topic and then jumps a, a picture on totally unrelated to your topic and then you continue with the other thing it's like why would a random picture be there exactly so okay. thank you a lot for asking maybe we can move on yeah maybe we can move on okay so parallelisms now this one it's a very very interesting uh, term and it's very related to coherence you'll see the the little bit about it right now and parallelism is about using the same type of words in heading lists and in a series of sentences uh, they the parallelism adds balance and rhythm to your reading it helps a lot with that it also provides clarity and memorability if a sentence has parallelism in it, it will be easier for your brain to remember. And also, it simplifies the text that you're reading, meaning that when you are reading it, you, will, you feel that the text is simple, it's understandable, and you want your readers to feel that. You want your readers to say, oh, okay, this flows perfectly, oh, I'm, un I'm understanding everything. All right, the message is super clear. So try to use parallelism. Now we're gonna go over some examples because this is sort of like a, a little bit of an abstract concept. So don't worry, I have examples for it. So this one, simple text, and I hope you get it because you must get it, people. Mm -hmm. Is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? Caught in the landslide, no escape from reality. Open your eyes, look up to the skies and see. All right, I bet you already know which song this one is, right? Of course, Arturo? Bohemian Rhapsody. Bohemian Rhapsody. And this one uses parallelism on the highlighted words. Is this, whatever. And then again, is this. There is a parallelism among those two sentences, which helps the reader or the listener in this case grasp what they are talking about. And the following sentences also have some parallelism. It says, open, look, and see. The verbs, all of them are on the same uh, tense and they are similar. They're short. They sound like a, with a single vowel or well not with the open But it's very very short So it helps to capture the attention of the listener or the reader because whenever they read or see the first sentence They sort of already expect the second sentence to be similar and when the similarity is fulfilled, they're like, ah, okay, yeah. there is similarity. It's a great moment. And there is rhythm and there is like a moment. Poetry and songwriting uses a lot of this resource, a lot, a lot, a lot. But now how would you use it on your regular text that it is not a song or it is not a poem? Well, here are more examples. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. These two are parallel sentences because they both start with it was and it was and they are similar in length. So it makes an impact. It says something powerful here. Yeah, and they're creating contrast, right? And conflict. And definitely. And here's another example. This is a government of the people, for the people, by the people. There, there is a parallelism among the ending parts of the, for the, by the. And using that parallelism makes a bigger impact into your writing. You remember all this, all this emotion like, oh my God, this is so powerful. And yet it is simple to read. All right, another example I have, very simple. I love reading, watching movies and traveling. Well, pretty simple, easy to read. And all my verbs end with ing. So the reader knows where this is going. It just- You're setting like the cadence, right? The cadence, the rhythm. So the read, reading becomes smoother and Definitely. flows better. And now uh, more ex ex an example, a little bit more attached to what you will actually write. The situation meant we had multiple challenges. The inability of the client to commit to a path, the ambiguity of the requirements communicated to us, the possibility of not finishing the project on time. All the bulleted items are parallel among them because they start with the and a word ending with T. And the length of the sentences are also similar among That's them. True. So this helps understand like, oh, okay. So it's one topic, the other topic, and the other topic. And the reader 
expects the bullet items to read like that and it helps them remember what you're talking about and they are already expecting something powerful on that. I truly believe that parallelism is magical. It does require a little bit of practice, but don't worry. As long as you try to get into parallelism, you'll get it. All right, cool. So just to recap, you have to remember that your audience sees things like first on the F pattern and they see headings and they see lead lines and they see images. Totally true. Remember these things are very important. And then, because they see those stuff, now how would you write to them? Well, you will write using the four C's. Clarity, no mixed messages. Coherence, remember that you want things to flow. Conciseness, just go to the point. Inconsistency, do not contradict yourself. If you said it something one way the first time, the second time you said it the same way. And parallelism, similar structure for additional magic. That's great. That's great, okay? Please remember these things, people. And now we're gonna continue to the part where you write, and whenever you write, remember, your first draft will suck. And I wanna make a huge emphasis on this. Your first draft will suck. And that's perfectly okay, more than okay. That's pretty much the rule for everything, right? Yeah, and I think as designer, we should be also mindful of this when we're doing ideation. We should not stop in the first idea because it's probably not the best idea. So we should strive for quantity over quality at those early stages when we are ex exploring and discovering in new ways to deliver the message. Mm -hmm. That's totally right. Just whenever you start writing, keep on writing. At the end of the day, it will suck. But then you may be asking yourself, how will you make it not suck? Well, that's the next step, self-review. This is the first step of having your content not sucked to improve your content, all right? Now, self-review for that, I have a few tips for you. First, let your text rest at least for a day. Whenever you write something and you believe that, ah, sort of is good enough, let it sit there, don't look at it, go do something else, go eat something, let it rest and then you go back to it. That helps us to not get tunnel vision, right? Yeah. Get too biased. Yeah, tunnel vision is the worst in every kind of review. Uh, well, whenever you actually go back to doing your first review, another advice that I would make for you is print it out and mark the issues that you are finding. Like really print it in paper if you don't feel bad for killing our trees. And <laughs> you can print it out and just with a marker or a pen, you can start scribbling on the things that you believe that should be changed. Whenever you do that, you have to check for grammar and typos. It's totally normal that we have a lot of grammar issues and a lot of typos. It happens to everybody. I mean, literally I get pay for writing and I do still have plenty of grammar or typos on my first draft, plenty of them. So maybe this is where you can plug Grammarly or Hemingway? Perfectly, yes. Definitely this is where you could plug Grammarly or Hemingway. But not before because it might get into your creative process of yes. coming up with ideas. Actually, it's very interesting that you said that, that you just said that because the recommendations of that Grammarly has, they are very um, forceful, let's say. If you wrote something, Grammarly says, no, this is wrong. And it's like, no, 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 but I want it to it's be too right. It's binary, right? Yes, it's too binary between yes or no. And if you are, uh, I don't know, if you don't have a strong opinion regarding your text, you will end up writing just what Grammarly wants. And that will probably not show what you want to show. So don't get to Grammarly just right away from day one. Yes, not taking it at face value. You know, it's trusting your gut sometimes. Yes, definitely, yes. Also, do not try to fix things while you are reviewing. The thing is like sometimes it happens that when you are reading your first paragraph, you spot something like, no, 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 this topic doesn't make sense here. I'm gonna move it later. But then you continue to read the second paragraph and you get the idea like, oh, wait, yes, it made sense to have this topic over here because my second topic is gonna be over there. So don't try to fix things at the same time that you are editing them. Just mark that you should re-review or go back and, and check it. So we should go single tasking, right? Yeah. First reviewing, then editing. Definitely. 
And finally, think like the final reader that you have in mind. While you do the review, ask yourself, does it make sense? Does it convey the message that I want to convey? Does it have all the information I wanted to convey? Like the insights that you got from Moscow? Well, does it include everything that you wanted to convey? You have to ask yourself all of those stuff. Do we have a question? I think we can continue. Cool, great. Um, okay, so once you're done with the self review, when you believe that your text is good enough for at least another couple of eyes, you can do peer review, all right? And peer review comes from two main sources. The first one that I will totally recommend you to do as the first one, get somebody totally new to the topic, like completely out of your designer uh, world. It could be your friend, your sibling, or even your mom. Anybody can do your first peer review. Just get somebody out of context, like, would you please read this for me? And this kind of peer review will help you answer a lot of interesting questions, like, are there any pending typos of grammar mistakes around there that you didn't get because of the tunnel vision? Right. Do I come out as a hero? Like, do, does the message that I am the hero really comes true? Was the achievement, like my goal, the outcome, was that clear enough? Like, was that like, this is the critical part, was that clear? Or is the general message clear? They will help you a lot because since they do not have context, they will only get the main ideas, like the critical big picture main ideas. And that's the first thing you wanna make sure that it's clear. The big picture main ideas, are they coming through? Right. So this is why peer reviews are important from somebody that does not know anything about the topic. Yeah, and maybe you can also realize if you're using some very technical words or language that might not be interpreted the way you would like to. Very, very real, completely. And now, once you're in the peer review, you want a second peer review. And this time, from somebody as close to your audience as possible. This could be a coworker, a friend that is a recruiter, or maybe your boss. And I mean, here I understand that we may be getting into a sensitive topic because sometimes people think that you write case study only for applying for new jobs. So it will be weird if you get to your boss who is not necessarily a friend right. about like, hey, would you read my case study? The first thing they will be possibly thinking is like, what? Are you going to try to jump cheap and go to another company? Well, there is no shame in getting polished. Writing case studies is not only for applying to a new job. Sometimes it's just to keep yourself up to date, it's to keep yourself sharp, or as a retrospective exercise. Like, okay, what did I do right on my previous project or what did I do wrong? What could I do better? How would be the next story I want to come up like? or just for showcasing for the sake of the company. For example, I've already been involved in writing case studies for our current company to showcase the value of the technical writing role. And Arturo, I believe you've been doing the same, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, it's like you can showcase what you brought to your company in the shape of a case study. So yeah, there's no shame on writing these things, just approach the correct people. And now having somebody that is close to your audience reading your text will help you answer a lot of questions sort of like, are there still any pending typos of grammar or mistakes? I mean, there's been plenty of reviews in my life and not even the third reviewer checked it out and it was the final audience, the fourth reviewer wow. that caught the error. And so it just keeps on happening. Tunnel vision is horrible. This audience, I mean, this peer review will help you also understand if your details are clear because since these are the ones that know all that you're talking about, like the heuristics about what's the use of a user story mapping, like for real, they know the real details. They will tell you like, are the details clear or do they have the level of detail is enough? They will help you a lot to understand this little tiny things that usually are not so well spotted. And they will also help you answer, do I sound too cocky? Because one thing is to say, oh yes, I'm the hero, cool. And the other thing is like say, oh, I'm the hero, I'm the best, I'm the 
perfect candidate for your job, you have to hire me, you will be privileged. So those are very two different things and these people will help you understand that. Yeah, that's why it's so important to have into consideration your personal brand, right? Because that's going to be the input of the tone and voice that you use on your writing. Yes, that's super, super critical. And finally, they can, they can also help you um, answer the question, is the message I want to convey clear? Because, okay, through your case study, you can showcase multiple things. Like you were saying, okay, my soft skills, my, my, the skills that I have with this, with this topic or with that other topic, you will be showcasing multiple items. Are all of these items clear enough? Not just the big picture like, oh, he's good. No, but the, all the multiple things. Is he good presenting the problems? Is he good presenting the outcomes? Is he good presenting the artifacts that they provide? Are they good with all those particular details? And okay, by this point in time, you already have a peer review from somebody that doesn't know about the topic and a peer review from somebody that knows a lot about the topic. On those two occasions, you will get a lot of feedback and on that feedback, never take it personally. Just say thank you, vigorously and happily if possible, because the end of the day regarding the feedback is to make your content improve, it's not to change you. If you are not a bad human being just because you made a typo, or you are not a horrible designer just because you couldn't explain something properly. It's not about you as a person. It's about the text probably not conveying what you wanted to convey. And it could be easily improved. So whatever feedback you get, just be grateful, say thank you, and act upon it. All right? Cool. So for recap, our huge, huge, huge recap of the session, First, on case studies, Arturo. Yeah, on case studies, we need to remember that they are in-depth analysis, so we really need to be obsessed with the details that we share, but they should be relevant and they should contribute to the story. And also, you need to understand that your, polio, your portfolio is another UX project, so you should set deadlines, you should consider the user, you should set milestones and, and do a process that is thoroughly reviewed. And finally, you are not the user of your portfolio. Your portfolio should not be the canvas in which you express all your uh, creative skills. You should consider it for your users. And in terms of audience, remember that it's better to stand out more than anyone else rather than feeding more than anyone else. And that satisfaction equals perception minus expectations. You first start with the expectations that your audience have. And once you meet those expectations, you can start working on the next level. And remember that the best way to uh, empathize with your audience is through meaningful stories. So crafting meaningful stories that they can relate to, they can feel part of becoming the heroes of the story, that can help you to deliver the message that you want to deliver. And finally, on writing, people read it an F pattern. So remember all the items of that F pattern. And you can write using your four C's, clarity, coherence, consistency, and conciseness. I know them. And parallelism, for do, these are to do magical text. And finally, self-review and peer review are the best tools to improve your writing. Not just because you believe that you may be a great writer means that it can be improved. Go for reviews, self and peer review. Awesome. So maybe before we wrap up this session, we can go through the last round of questions. We have a very interesting question from Eugenia. Thank you very much for asking. And she's asking about how to showcase work that it's not maybe uh, execution based, but coach strategy based. And that's a great question. I believe that we should not put all the heavy lifting into the portfolio, right? Because at the end of the day, we have our personal brand and we have a lot of extensions of that brand. How do you conduce yourself through interviews? How do you do your portfolio? And maybe if you're telling a great story about how great you are a coach, you should embed that story in all your touch points. So it's okay to craft stories that relate to your coaching strategies in your portfolio, but that should not be the only way that you tell the, those skills that you have. Also, um, on that note, your work at the end of the day is a story that you could tell. Like 
Maybe you're not delivering a particular artifact, like uh, something physical, but you deliver something, you deliver a result. And you can talk about that as part of the story. Yeah, and at the end of the day, if their work is successful, you yeah. are successful as well. Definitely. So if you're showing their successes, you're showing your success as well. Most definitely, totally. And that's it, right? We can have a quick more questions if you have them. Otherwise, we can start wrapping up the session. A uh, reminder, we have our last session during the next week with Oliver Gonzalez and Emilio Uribe, who are UI designers and visual designers, very talented designers in the team. And they're going to be elaborating on how to build your portfolio, right? How do you really execute your portfolio in a really interesting way? Mm, thank and you. we're going to send the survey for your feedback. Your feedback is very important for us. So expect that uh, link on our Slack channels. And that's it. Thank you very much. We thank hope to much. see you next week here. If you have any further questions, feel free to reach me out through social media or through the Slack channel. I will be more than happy. And I think we will be more than happy to answer those questions. Yay. Thank you, people. Thank you.